have uh, one of the greatest founders that's running a remote company, Sid, who's running a company called GitLab. I think potentially one of the biggest remote companies of all time, potentially. And uh, uh, so maybe Sid, do you want to give us a little introduction? I know this is going out on your uh, live stream, but uh, it's also going to be syndicated in other places. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for your interest. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to talk with you. And uh, yeah, GitLab is a complete uh, DevOps platform delivered as a single application. It's a, uh, and the company is all remote. We don't have any uh, uh, places where people uh, are co-located. And it's uh, 1,300 people at the company and thousands of people who have contributed to the open source project. And this is across all time zones. Yeah, we have people in 60, not all time zones, but we have people in 65 countries. Wow. Well, um, to zoom out a little, what we're trying to do with this series is, you know, everyone is kind of remote, you know, before all these, all, all these CEOs like myself were thinking, and remote sounds really interesting. Maybe they had a hybrid model and maybe they had some engineers across the country, but maybe they had headquarters in San Francisco. And now we are all a hundred percent remote. And I suspect a lot of these CEOs are secretly kind of fre freaking out internally. There's a lot of fear, which being CEOs, they tend not to demonstrate. They tend to put, put on a uh, stiff upper lip, as we say in England. But there's a lot of fear because we have not run remote companies before. We don't know how to, um, and we're searching around for answers. And this is what this series is all about. It's a mini series with some of the best remote founders to try and learn from them. And uh, Matt, I wonder if you have anything else to add? Yeah, I think I can take that one step further. So I coach um, a lot of CEOs of, of tech scaling tech companies and they have come to me and I said, you know, I always ask, how can I be more effective and more um, valuable to you? And, and it's pretty universal. They've all said, Matt, we need you to go out and become the expert in how to run a remote company because that's what we need most right now. So that's really that. And, and Alex, you know, also feels that need. That's what inspired this. So we're talking to the CEOs of the intentionally remote companies, not the accidentally remote, which everybody is. And I think, Sid, that you are basically at the apex of that world. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you run the largest, at least by number of people, intentionally remote company that exists, at least in the tech world. Is that we, fair? We, we think so, although WordPress is also pretty significant. Fair yeah. enough. And, but, but also in terms of thought leadership, you've published the most, made all your documents public, so that everyone can understand actually how you operate. And it's clear from those published documents just how much care and thought you've put into the act of running a remote company. So you don't have to respond to that. That's just a compliment. With that, let's dive into um, your view of what the most important things are. And I think um, where I'd love to start is, um, Sid, if you can just sort of by way of background, tell us why it is, you know, basically your founding story. Why did you choose to go remote, all remote in the first place? And what have been the benefits of that decision? We'll get into the cons later, but first, what were the benefits? Yeah, so uh, the first employee was uh, in Serbia. I was in the Netherlands and Dimitri was in the Ukraine. So that's how we started off being remote is because we're in different countries. Um, I hired a couple of people in the Netherlands. Uh, they came to my house. I had two desks in a room. And then uh, day four, they stopped showing up. Uh, it was kind of a pattern and it, it's never, it was never explicit. It's just, I invited them for their first day on Monday and they showed up the next day and the next day and then they didn't show up day four. Um, and I was a bit puzzled. Like they didn't say, they didn't ask, I, but they showed up on chat. Uh, so I was like, okay, well, whatever. And uh, so they kept they, working. They just kept not, working. Not at your house just didn't ring the bell at my house and kind of makes sense because it was a, a commute for them. Uh, why do that if the whole rest of the team isn't at my house? And after three days, we were mostly sitting beside each other, uh, looking at our laptops anyway. Um, the next phase was Y Combinator. We were all in the house together. I sometimes jokingly say we were, we're now stringent on all remote because we live together for three months in a way too small house, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of those experiences that are really great in hindsight. Um, and uh, they told us like, look, not a lot of 
startups are successful remote, people try it, but it seems to work for engineering, but not anything else. And we're like, okay, we'll heed to that advice. So we got an office on Ethan Howard in San Francisco and uh, put, uh, put seven or eight desks in there. And uh, first person showed up, Hayden, he was already working at GitLab for a while. And same there. Day four, he doesn't show. Again, like he didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. We didn't agree on that. It's just, it wasn't part of our culture. And it was, for him, it was like, why travel all the way from Alameda to SF when all you're doing is you sit next to Sid who's talking to his camera all day. So again, it wasn't needed. And uh, then we had a ton of execs that came in and said, oh, I remember our sales leader was like, oh, I don't think this is going to work. I think it, we have to be co-located. I'm like, great. We got this lease on this office. We're paying a ton of money, so feel free. But he lived in Sacramento. So he was, his, he saved four hours a day of commuting. So like, it was kind of tempting for him to also embrace it. And then uh, I think the last barrier was our SDRs, our sales development representatives, people, uh, most of the people pretty at the start of their career was like, ah, these people need kind of the vibe of, of being in an office in the high fives and didn't turn out that way. We had, we hired great people. Many of them were in Utah. They did great. And you can be enthusiastic over zoom and in Slack and celebrate each other. You, it's actually convenient that you have silence around you if you're talking with a, a customer. So Time and time again, we weren't against it, but it just didn't happen. And at a certain point, we said, okay, we, we better make sure to embrace this. And the hardest point was our Series B fundraise, uh, where we really had to kind of make a case that this could work and could scale. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Wow. Uh, and then I'd like to dive, well, actually, we, we said we're going to talk about the benefits and, and the cons. So what ha that's how it all got started. But now in hindsight, what are the benefits of that decision? I think the, by far the biggest benefit has been uh, the ability to hire great people. It's been great for our talent brand. Like we're a proponent of all remote work. Uh, we got a lot of attention because of that. Plus we can hire people in almost everywhere in the world. So a lot of people, if people notice us and they like what they see, they, they're very likely to be able to join the company if they meet the requirements. So um, the in the end, a company is a collection of people, uh, and uh, we were able to hire better people. I think that's the, the top thing that improved. Apart from that, it's also like a whole lot less distraction. Last year, we tripled the company from 400 to 1,200 people. Imagine trying to have to like move offices twice a year or something. It would be a big distraction. Offices and, and facilities management is a huge expense and risk. And also because we have people all around the world, not everyone is in uh, metro areas with super expensive uh, salaries. I can tell you that that is uh, very enticing uh, right now because we have a massive lease that uh, is, is going unused. So um, having everyone at home makes a lot of sense. It would be great to hear from you, Darren, head a remote for a, a thousand plus remote org. That's a pretty serious job. It'd be great to hear a bit about what that entails and, and uh, learn a bit more from you. Yeah, thanks so much. It uh, has evolved quite a bit since I joined. When I joined the company, I was working for the CMO and uh, it was basically to tell our remote story to the world. The media knew about the DevOps side of GitLab, but not so much that we're pioneering the future of work. And so I methodically started building out the all remote section of our handbook, which now spans over 40 guides. And it talks about everything that we do remotely from asynchronous to meetings, to hiring compensation, the whole gamut. And we're building that out and iterating on that all the time. Uh, but in the process of doing that, it became really useful for the people group. So I'm helping with onboarding, making sure that our onboarding is really prescriptive and articulate. You gotta remember a lot of people are joining the company, company from a co-located space. So acclimating to all remote can be difficult or jarring. And a lot of it takes reinforcement. And so I'm working with, with that group and building that out. And then more recently working with learning and development and formalizing what manager training looks like to make sure all of our managers know how to work remotely. And they work remote first and they have a bias towards asynchronous. All of these things that are really, really important to reinforce company-wide for this remote thing to thrive. Awesome. Right. Thanks, Darren. And then coming back to Sid. 
So Sid, we were, you talked about the, the benefits you can hire, you know, great people elsewhere that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Um, and this is actually a fear that people have. People fear that will they actually be able to hire great people outside of the Bay Area? Because they're not really sure that those great people exist outside of the Bay Area. You actually know. And, and you may say, well, we can hire great engineers outside. But what about business development? What about customer service? What about marketing? Well, those are shit. Exactly. So can you please, keep knowing that people have that fear, how would you address that? Yeah. Um, it is not equally distributed, especially the later in careers you get. If you want someone who has run um, a technology startup that has gone public, you're going to end up in the Bay Area a lot of times. And typically go-to-market efforts are located close to the customers. The US is the biggest software market in the world by far. So if you're gonna look at sales and marketing talent, you're gonna very likely end up in the metro areas of the US and very likely just on the West Coast and East Coast. Um, so it is tougher to get diversity there. And our executive team is a reflection of that where we have two thirds in the Bay Area, and then a person in Mountain Time and a person in Ireland, but uh, it's there's less diversity there. Uh, by the way, being remote makes it much easier to hire because everyone in the Bay Area is tired of their commute. And there are some people from the Bay Area that want to move, for example, to be close to uh, the rest of their family, to their parents. And if you're a truly remote company where the executive team is truly remote, you have a very unique proposition to them. Thank you.